What's up guys, Frank here from Garageaholic giving you an episode unlike you've probably never seen before from most channels. And by that I mean it is quite interactive for my viewers. How so? Well today we have an E53 X5. It's an 4.6 IS Alpina inspired E53. It's, it's all wheel drive and we're gonna be converting it to a rear wheel drive, six speed manual, G-Trag 420G and we're gonna be doing all the fixings. You guys really don't want to miss this episode. This is a very special interactive surprise at the end that would that may or may not uh, intrigue you quite a bit. So hopefully you enjoy it. Please watch it all the way through and please like, comment, and subscribe. And here we go, guys. Buckle up. Enjoy. Here we go, guys. We got a 2002 build date uh, August of 2002 uh, x5 4.6 is this is the alpina inspired engine um, we are doing a full six speed swap rear wheel drive with a limited slip differential and um, we are going to be making this thing fully stout well let's start off with the transmission so we need to take this whole transmission out i don't even know what it's called i don't even care nobody knows it nobody cares nobody wants it it's um it's got the transfer case bolted to the back of it which is pretty good actually i think that i want to save that for some other project in the future but we needed to get that thing out um it was kind of a bear to get out but then after realizing that i did it the wrong way and that i should have taken the torque converter along with the transmission it would have made the removal so much easier but hey that's the way it works um, we did remove it, we got it down, and uh, this thing is essentially garbage, a big paperweight. So there it is. There's the hunk of metal right there. And we are replacing it with a much lighter version of that, a much lighter, more fun version. So we're, we're installing our uh, our dual mass flywheel here. The bolts are already in there, so we gotta put that in and torque them down. I decided to just you know clean the mating surface on the flywheel just for fun, but um, you really don't need to do this. You probably should get a brand new flywheel, but um, this really was in excellent condition, so it really was no need to, to get a new one, especially for the purposes that my customer is using it for anyway. Uh, the, don't forget the pilot bearing. The pilot bearing is so very important to install. Um, if you overlook it, then you're gonna be basically cantilevering that input sha uh, the, the input shaft of the transmission, and that's not good for anyone. So. Again, here we go. We're torquing these guys down. I believe it's 80 foot pounds. Um, put the clutch in. We put our clutch centering tool in. Uh, this is kind of like a homemade centering tool. Um, put the uh, pressure plate on. And uh, we install the pressure plate and torque that all down to spec. You'll see in a second that those springs on the pressure plate are not fully pushed in enough. And you'll see why right now. Truth be told, um, a few weeks later after the transmission was installed, I needed to remove it in order to remove the pressure plate and reset the clutch uh, pressure plate springs that you see there. The, those little three little springs need to be reset whenever you remove the pressure plate, even if you're reinstalling the clutch disc in the same position. Um, doesn't matter, you gotta reset that clutch pressure plate, so it's very important you do that, or else your clutch pedal release feel is not going to be the same. Thank you, I these things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back here. <laughs> so this guy I've been waiting for for a very long time because without this piece, I can't do a transmission brace. Without the transmission brace, I can't shorten the shifter. Everything that we, this is clean too. Oh my gosh, check this out. I gave them very explicit instructions. They did it for a great price. Much cheaper than many of the other competitors that I've used out there in the past. 
real nice. Excellent. Now let's put this down. The guy I've been waiting for for a very long time because without this piece, I can't do a transmission brace. Without the transmission brace, I can't shorten the shifter. And I needed to do that. So this is essentially holding up the entire project. But it's okay because it's finally in. This is from Carolina Drive Shaft. Ow. This is from Carolina Drive Shaft, and it is a new rebuilt custom length drive shaft that has everything that we, this is clean too. Oh my gosh, check this out. I gave them very explicit instructions. They did it for a great price. Much cheaper than many of the other competitors that I've used out there in the past. Real nice. Excellent. Now let's put this down. They even gave me the old pieces of drive shaft that I might need for something else down the road. So really happy about that. But we got to wait until the rubber meets the road and see how this thing actually fits. Remember when I was talking about earlier about the drive shaft is going to define the rest of the build in terms of where things are. And I can explain why now. There's a very good reason for that. Mainly, once the drive shaft is in place, it looks like it's going to fit. It's going to define where that transmission bracket is going to be. And because, and the reason that that's important is because you want to make sure that, <laughs> the reason you want to make sure that's in, is because um, if the guibo is not properly aligned with the front face of the drive shaft, it's going to vibrate significantly. And, uh, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in a second. But as of right now, I can't get this in there. It looks like this is going to fit really nicely. So, so questions of the past here is why not just use the E53 manual drive shaft? Um, and the reason is because, first of all, we're going to a rear wheel drive setup. So there's no transfer case there. That's going to make the front half of the drive shaft inherently longer in order to mate to the guibo on the transmission itself. The second reason is that even if this was a rear wheel drive swap, that wouldn't really matter either because um, the GS6 uh, 420G actually does not uh, bolt onto the transfer case. That's why, that's why you'll never see an all wheel drive manual V8 BMW out there uh, from this era, that is, you know, the M60s the uh, S60 era engines. So because of that, and we're going with rear wheel drive, we have to have a front half uh, of the drive shaft to be a custom length. So the reason that it's important to have the drive shaft installed before doing your custom transmission bracket is because you don't know how high the transmission is going to sit yet. You've got a pretty good idea by looking at the oil pan. But at, but at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is the mating face between the guibo output and the transmission and the, the drive shaft. And as you can see here, there's a pretty big gap right there at the bottom of the tri-hole prongs, and at the top is actually not a very big gap at all. What that means is that if you decide that this is where the transmission is going to be, and then you get the drive shaft later, and it looks like this, you're going to have every rotation is going to have that guibo working harder by expanding and contracting because it's not concentric on the output of the drive. So what you need to do then is if I were to take this and pump it up a little bit, you'll see But now, that space there is very close to that space there. If I were to rotate it all the way up, if the shadow doesn't mess it up, you can see right there the space is very close. So now what I've, I've, I understand that the transmission needs to be positioned at this particular angle. And what I'm really actually going to do is I'm going to do it just a little bit higher so that when it settles down on the, the, the bushings, it's actually going to settle directly onto place. And that's just something that I do with the experience that I have working on this and I know exactly how much higher I need to go, but this gets me really, really, really close to the ballpark of where that is and to prevent any potential vibrations.
So the reason we had to replace the front springs and go with the H&R lowering springs is because we essentially lost a lot of weight up front. I mean, it, you don't think about it, but it adds up. You got your half shafts, you got your front differential, you've got your front drive shaft, and of course, we replaced the very heavy 5 HP transmission with its transfer case with a much lighter GS uh, 420G, a uh, 420G Geetreg six-speed manual. So we've lost a lot of bit, a lot of weight up front, and that's going to allow the front to actually sit where it should. It's not going to look lower. It's not going to give it an aggressive rake, but it's going to definitely look the way it should, as as, as if it were just a normal all-wheel drive vehicle. So this is actually one little uh, invention that I came up with with my partner. This is a uh, spring compressor bracket assembly that bolts onto the side arm of a lift. As long as you have sufficient pressure from the weight of the car that you have on the lift, you can use this tool to push down and compress your springs on a McPherson strut assembly, take the spring out and reinstall using the same uh, setup. It's relatively universal. It clamps on, on top of the hat of the spring compressor and it allows you to safely, much more safely than those eBay spring compressors, um, compress the spring. And, uh, and then you can uh, install your nut on the top. And it's really, really cool how this works. I was very proud of this uh, design and we actually sell them on our website now. So you can uh, purchase these for, I don't know, 70 bucks or whatever that I have them. And uh, it's a really, really great uh, addition to any, any shop. And here we're just uh, refurbing our brakes. You know, uh, we got to get those sliders in really good condition. So we have to clean them up. Uh, we got to sand them down, uh, smooth them out, and lube them back up. Uh, it's very self-explanatory how to do this. Uh, just make sure you get all the dust off of everything. And then when you reinstall those sliders, make sure that they slide in and out really nice and you're golden. So let's just voice over this entire process here. Um, you got to start with ma making sure that that transmission is in the right location. And that's paramount, right? Everything else that you do here from here on out is going to be driven off of that location. So make sure that that thing is not moving. Then you use cardboard to get the right template. Um, and you know, the one piece of cardboard is preferred over multiple taped pieces of cardboard together. And that's kind of what I decided to do here. Um, this was a V style transmission bracket that goes onto each rail. Unfortunately, using the existing transmission bracket um, and making you know uh, pieces of metal that comes off of it so that the transmission can sit on it was just too risky in my opinion. Making a custom one was not only fun but educational. Uh, the process was therapeutic and it was relatively easy to do, uh, especially if you have the right tools. Here we're using the arc droid to cut this to cut this up. Um, and basically we use the trace function to trace over what our cardboard layout was and we used it to actually cut it. Uh, this is quarter inch steel, mild steel, so it was painted. We've identified where our bend marks need to be, so we laid the cardboard on top of the steel and marked on the side of where those bend marks are gonna be. And then we just um, created those lines on the actual steel piece. Um, using the bearing press with the um, off-road, swag off-road, a brake bender. We use the 20 ton press to actually bend to the right angles that we needed. And it was a little bit of, a little bit of trial and error. And if you over bend, you can always go back and unbend a little bit. Um, and then uh, just basically fit it up. And once it was fitted up, it wasn't too difficult to move from there. Um, you make sure that that it sits up against those frame rails. And when you do, you'll see that you just kind of mark the holes and where those holes are located. Uh, drill your holes and then use your rivet nuts. We used M8s here, so the M8s just push right into the hole that we made and uh, unscrew that and it clamps the rivet nut right in place. Then we do our semi-final installation where we can test to see that the holes and the rivet nuts are in the right location. And then from there, um, we tighten it up 
and we bring the jack down and to see how everything looks because it's really important again like i said that that drive shaft is concentric with the output of the transmission so um you know kind of want to show you what it looks like here and you can see that there's a tiny little space there and i'm going to be fighting with the shadow here but um you know there's a tiny space on the bottom and there is an equally tiny space on the top. So this is like an A plus job in my opinion, getting this all set up. So then I painted it, I gusseted in the center and, uh, and then I consider this a job completed. I don't think that this requires any more gusseting, doesn't require any more um, strengthening. Uh, that quarter inch steel is not going anywhere. So yes, job well done. So yep, to remove the differential, just about everything needed to be removed in the rear end. Um, we safely removed it down and put it put it on the bench for us to uh, safely and uh, effectively basically disassemble the entire thing. Started off with the rear cover, found out that this is actually a 188L, which is a short um, pinion. It's a relatively rare transmission uh, differential to use. Um, but you know, getting uh, getting the right gear set was important. This was a 391, and we went down to a um, 346. Uh, everything was pressed in pretty good, so we had to use the uh, the 20 ton press in order to get that pinion out. Um, but yeah, we ended up using um, a uh, the press to put the new bearings in. And that was actually kind of fun, satisfying actually. So everything is installed and you'll see that there is a gap right there in between the circlip there and the uh, output bearing. If I were to take this and squeeze this in, you'll see that that gap will soon disappear there. See that? So basically what that gap is, is this thing is just moving around. You can even see the bearings in there kind of like shaking around. So even if I were to turn this, very clunky uh, because the output bearings aren't even fitting inside of here. You see this? So everything is just super loose and I need a set of shims to, that basically install in between the circlip and the output bearing holder. So there's some on here that I'm gonna need and there's some on here that I'm gonna need in order to get this backlash perfectly set and then I can start taking the measurements and the backlash, all that that I need. Yeah, so, so now it's just time really for a reassembly of this thing. Um, the backlash was within spec. Um, the gear mesh was really good, nice and centered. The heel and the toe was, wasn't too far in, far out. We reinstalled the rear cover and we just put the whole thing back together. I mean, it really wasn't that difficult to do. A lot of bolts to do, um, but everything was torqued and uh, the installation was pretty simple. All right. Now the differential is done, completely installed. We've got a 346 limited slip in the rear now. We can start focusing on getting that drive shaft installed that'll place our transmission to the correct location so we can do our transmission brackets. And then all it is after that is plumbing and pedals. Pedal assembly is relatively straightforward. You just get any E39 pedal assembly and you adapt it into the E uh, the E53. It's relatively simple to do and and honestly the accessibility is quite impressive under there when you're doing this. So it wasn't really uncomfortable. It really was pretty easy to do. All right, now it's time to get this clutch line in, and it's a specially formulated. E53 clutch line that goes through the transmission tunnel housing there. So I'm now just fitting that in. This side here obviously is a press, con press to connect fitting on the uh, clutch mesh cylinder and it falls back behind here. So we gotta try getting this guy in. Um, I feel like it's easier to start over there and then work from work the other way around, but um, I might have to take it out just to try the other way around just in case, but we'll see. It seems like they've made the provisions for the manual swap anyway, uh, having little notches in the carpet there to hide the, the tube. But let's just keep on at it and uh, let you know how it goes. A master cylinder is installed and I am not actually gonna install it because I still need to bleed the system and bleeding it from the back and pushing it in like this is gonna be so much easier to get all the air out. This guy is settled in here and that actually goes and clips into this bolt here after the master cylinder is installed. So what we need to do now is go to the brake reservoir, take our hose and install it onto the actual reservoir so we can start getting brake fluid to flow. And look how easy this is gonna be. There's the hose. 
and it just needs to clip onto that. So I'm just gonna cut this off really quick, slice the hose on, and uh, put a little clamp on it, and it's not going anywhere. But yeah, that's what this is designed for. These brake master cylinders are designed to have both, you know, manual and automatic uh, setups. And we are, since we're converting the manual, we can just clip off that edge and uh, put the hose right on. that hose clamp and we're good to go. Now this clutch pedal feels. Oh, it's coming up. It's definitely coming up on its own. Now that the transmission is clean, spick and span, everything is basically installed, starters reinstalled, we need to take care of these lines. These are the automatic transmission cooling lines. And both of those lines kind of go up to this heat exchanger right here. This is a heat exchanger, and basically the way it works is you have your two cooling lines that go into the heat exchanger, and that exchanges the heat with the coolant side. So I was thinking about whether or not I wanna remove this. Um, removing this actually opens up the cooling system, and you're gonna need to plug it up in a different way by the hoses that go to it and everything else, and there's a manifold here that actually connects to other hoses and the radiator itself. The easiest thing to do, in my opinion, in a swap like this, is you just take the two lines and disconnect them. You're gonna get some ATF that comes out of here, and that's okay. But at least the, the 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 heat exchanger portion of this is going to be closed off on the coolant side, and that's really the most important thing. So let's keep this simple. Let's keep it easy. Let's keep it cheap, and uh, and let's just disconnect those two lines and make it a little bit cleaner under here. All right, so now we're doing the shifter. And when you shorten the shifter, you gotta do it in two stages. First is the shift carrier. It's aluminum and it needs to be shortened first. You wanna make sure that that thing is centered right in the hole where that shifter is gonna actually be located. Right now, we've got this thing sit, sitting. We got Dan down below here. And this thing is as centered as it gets. So basically it's sitting in position. This right here is where the carrier is. And, um, and Dan's got it basically sitting right over the transmission where those bushings are gonna go into the top of the, the Geetrag 420. And now we've got this done, we can take it out and we can uh, weld it up. And that's stage one. Stage two is then when we start working on the shifter selector rod. And that is determined by how this shifter is gonna look. Now this is a pretty gnarly looking shifter. This is for an E53 and that sits just like that. And when we get it perfectly where we want it, it's gonna look something like that, which is exactly what you want it to look like in a vehicle just like this. All right, Dan. Now, while this is a factory E53 uh, shift carrier, we took out quite a bit. And the reason being, as I had explained earlier, is that we are using a different transmission that this car is not used to being installed in. So the transmission is longer than the six speed uh, from the uh, M54. And uh, as a result, this whole thing gets shortened, uh, I don't know, what, two inches, something like yeah. that. So now we just need to tack it up, weld it up, and then we can start working on the selector rod. All right, so Dan got the selector rod basically tacked for now. It's not welded, it's just tacked. Because if we have to make an adjustment based on how the gears feel and how the, the shifter looks, then we're gonna easily be able to change that. Dan, you ready down there? Okay, so this is neutral. Feels pretty good. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And I might break those tacks if I try reverse, but I'm gonna try it anyway, because it's important. Just like that. All right, so it's sitting really nice in here, actually. I'm pretty happy with the way it's sitting. And the gear shift is slightly facing the driver, which is kind of normal. I like that. Nice. That selector rod is just about done. Dan did a really good job with these TIG welds. He's actually getting, becoming a pretty good TIG welder, to be honest with you. 
So yeah, I mean, installing this was a cinch. Um, the selector rod and the shift carrier turned out really good. We cleaned up the transmission um, and, and got everything looking real nice and profesh. Uh, everything's been torqued and torque sealed. Uh, and it's a really nice looking underside, to be honest with you. I'm pretty proud of the, uh, the quality of the work that was done here. It is very reliable and it just looks real good. So basically everything underneath the car is buttoned up. We need to reinstall the exhaust and we need to reinstall the heat shields. Um, we have four oxygen sensors that we've properly labeled under here, right? So we've color coded them prior to removing them so we know exactly which oxygen sensor goes where, even though the connectors are already keyed, I already know that, but I wanna make sure that the routing of the wires is good too. We've got these two guys here. These are our old tr uh, automatic transmission uh, connectors that we're probably just gonna cut off but before I cut them off, I wanna make sure that if I need to jump a couple pins in order to trick the DME into thinking it's there, I need to do that first. Um, so I wanna just get this whole thing all buttoned up and then I can take a look at the connectors when we do our first start. <laughs> our first start. What we need to do is because I used the exact location of one of the hangers for this, uh, here I need to take this off and use that actually to hold on the exhaust heat shield. Furthermore, I'm gonna need to salvage some of the existing transmission bracket in order to use that as the hanger because that's where the hanger for the exhaust actually holds on to, which is kind of like right in this space. So we need to actually take that, cut it off, reinstall it as is and use that piece as the hanger for the exhaust. So yeah, there's always a couple little things you don't, you don't, you miss. So this is the whole transmission bracket. This is the piece that we cut off and needed. We painted it and we got our mounting hole, throw it on. Now we have our exhaust hangers. Nothing to really say here. It's just completing the whole thing, making everything look factory, look OEM. Uh, it just really completes the whole look. Okay, so it was kind of foolish for me just to think that I would just get in the car and start it. I kind of knew that it wouldn't happen. Uh, and I also do know that I need to trick the DME into thinking that the transmission is in park, but that's really kind of all like doesn't matter. Uh, doing that stuff anyway, because I need to program the DME anyway to be a manual. So um, there's a lot of things I still need to do wiring and program wise. So I just got hooked up into INPA here and um, I'm just making sure that I can connect to it and talk to the car, which I can. Um, and now I wanna see what existing uh, part number is on here. I think that the part number is, so yeah, that's the assembly number. That's the guy right there that I need to have changed. This is the VIN of this car. That's the assembly number for this DME. And I need to have that changed to a different number. I'll show you that right now. That is actually, there's a few of them that'll work and I'm gonna try them all in WinKFP and hopefully it'll take. So what we're actually doing here is we're coding the uh, the combi, which is the instrument cluster. We're just getting rid of all those letters, the park reverse neutral, um, and we're making sure that everything else within it works. Um, and this is actually relatively easy to do. You can see right there, bam, it's resetting, and there goes the park reverse neutral drive, and now it is an auto, a manual um, combi, which is pretty cool. So, coding ended, we are in good shape. Now comes the reverse switch wiring. Now, it's not as simple as just the two pins on the reverse switch just go to some sort of switch that goes to directly to your lights. When you go into reverse, what's supposed to happen is that um, uh, the lights come on and then your mirrors go down based on the switch that you have here. So it's actually an integrated thing. So you need to actually wire up the switch. It is still a two prong switch on the transmission, but it needs to go to the IKE. So I took that wire and I snaked it up and I snaked it into pin uh, 25 on A63. That's the blue connector on the back side here you can see that blue connector and then the other pin from the reverse wire goes directly to ground which i've just installed right there 
Um, so it's just a regular chassis ground. And hopefully when we go into reverse, those reverse lights not only come on, but also the mirrors go down if we really want them to. I'm not too concerned about the mirrors function. I really just want the lights to work. All right, I think I've got everything done and set up here. So if I were to press on the brake, you can see behind. Two, three. And now if I go into reverse, one, two, three. So I'm gonna talk about the clutch pedal switch wiring, but we ended up not incorporating the clutch pedal because my customer didn't want it. Now there's two different kinds of clutch pedal switches that you can use. Um, you have this type, which is the normal plunger type. This is a three wire. And you also have the other type, which is this. This clutch pedal switch is actually a four wire. There's four pins in there. You can see them right there. And it actually attaches, this is like a magnetic switch that moves in and out and it provides detailed status of the clutch pedal position. We are not gonna be using this version, but you can. There's a fourth pin we can talk about in a minute. Just so you know, wiring up the clutch pedal switch for this type of a swap is not mandatory. It is kind of a like to have, it's a good convenience feature. And I actually look at it as a bit of a safety feature and here's why. Yes, if you have the clutch pedal switch not wired, then you can start the car without pressing the pedal. That's fine, yes. Um, but if you're, at, if you're uh, on the highway and you're um, on cruise control and uh, you wanna slow down and you just press the clutch pedal without pressing the brake pedal. Remember, the brake pedal is already wired up into the cruise control, but if you just press the clutch pedal, what's gonna happen is the engine is just gonna race uh, to redline uh, because it doesn't know that the clutch pedal has been pushed in, so it doesn't know to turn cruise control off. Remember when I said more on that fourth pin later? Well, that fourth pin actually goes to the EWS module, and what it does is when you push the clutch all the way in, it goes from nine volts to 12 volts, and that sends a 12 volt signal to pin six on the EWS. Conveniently located right there. It's that green lettering unit. So I've disconnected the connector here, and I want, I want to feign 12 volts to that all the time so that you don't have to worry about pressing the clutch. Now it's because I have the three pin and not a four pin. If I had a four pin, I just wire that fourth pin up directly into this. Now keep in mind that, that, that this wire that I cut, this uh, blue with the black stripe, this wire here originally went to the automatic transmission module. So I just cut it and I'm gonna repurpose it as a 12 volt switch, a 12 volt wire on switched power that's coming from the, uh, the newly acquired uh, 12 volt from the brake and the clutch pedal switch. So to splice these two wires, and I think that I am good to go with the clutch pedal wiring. So now we're doing the very last step, which is programming the DME to be a manual. And we are, we finally got it working. I don't know how I got it working, but I, I, I had to reload the assembly line code into Win, uh, WinKFP. I thought that I had a 3264 bit issue, but I don't. It is now loading the assembly line. This is the assembly line number 753392. That is from an E39 540 manual. So it's literally taking that um, uh, calibration and putting it onto the DME. So we're about 15% way through. We're keeping our battery charger on here and I'm hoping that once this is done and it says programming okay, that this thing will actually start. Okay, the user field info can be programmed 12 times. Okay. And looks like it's going through this one more time, which it should be a little bit quicker. And then it should say programming okay. Come on, programming okay. Okay, now we start it up. All right, so now I wanna check really quick, shift F8. I wanna go and I wanna make sure that the correct assembly number was fully loaded. So I'm going into IMPA to check the coding. And I'm looking for right here, 7533593, that, oh, sorry, 7533592, -3 the assembly number, that's what I want. This is officially uh, coded as a manual car. So now I'm gonna try to start it, but I'm not gonna push the clutch pedal in and I'm expecting that it's not gonna work. No, it's not, not working. So now here comes the real moment of truth is I push the clutch pedal in and it does start. 
Nothing. Well, that didn't work, um, and I'm thinking that there's an EWS problem. I think that the DME is fine. I flashed it just fine. What I want to do is I just want to jump the whole circuit and just go directly from the starter and just um, apply power to it directly. So the key is in position two, which is what it should be when you're trying to start the car. If I were to just take this, and I can't reach it. <laughs> Here we go. So, I think it saw something to do with the DME programming. Four ZBs so far, so four assembly lines, um, and uh, most of them don't work. There's a Euro one here that I'll try, but then you got this one here. I haven't tried that one yet, and it might work. Let's see. Um, I already programmed it, so it's like the last one that I can think of uh, before this, before I have to take it somewhere to have done. Let's see here. Okay, here we go, turning. Okay, so it actually cranks, but it's not starting. All right, I could do that. I can I can handle that. Holy shit! All right. Okay. Well, why didn't it start? <laughs> Let's figure that out. So this is the one fault I have. I'm not sure what Kerbal Wellenjeber means, but I'll have to look it up real quick. Looks like it's some sort of signal. But yeah, let me take a look at this. Well, it appears that. Code 111 is a very common code. It is the crankshaft position sensor. Without knowing the crankshaft position, it's not gonna start. But I thought, where is the crankshaft position sensor? So this is the crankshaft position sensor on the old automatic transmission. That's where the bell housing is and that's where the sensor is. I actually cut it off, no big, no big deal. I can always put it back on. Um, I gotta figure out where that actually installs on the six speed transmission and get that in. Well, there it is. That makes a lot of sense. And now that I've clipped those wires, I just need to reconnect them and I think I should be in good shape. Okay, so I reconnected the CPS and I rewired it. Um, there's only two wires, there's a black one and a yellow one. And then you got a shield because it's a shielded assembly. I had to cut the wire and I had to, as long as you connect the shields together for a short run that you're cutting, just tape it up, you're fine. Um, let's see if this thing starts now. <sighs> All right, so not in gear, <laughs> not in gear. Turn and hold. Yes, it's running real rough. We're gonna have to diagnose some engine issues, of course, but it is running. Okay, the wiper flu is low. Let's see if the pedal works. All right, so the oil temperature is something I don't look at. Got a couple of faults here, but it's running. <laughs> yes. This is like the most exciting thing, right? All right, so if I were to just put it in first, slowly let up on the clutch. Let's see if those wheels are spinning. It is. You can see I, drew, I had it on the lift, I started it, it ran, the tires moved, everything seems to be going well with the drive line. Um, now I, I have to get in it, I'm gonna rock it back and forth a few times, I'm gonna go up and down the driveway a few times and maybe I'll just take it out on the road and we'll see how this thing is because I think that we really won't understand how the engine performs, how everything performs until we get it up to operating temperature. And I think that's really my goal today is to get it up to operating temperature. So those of you who follow me religiously on this channel know that I like to do things in stages, in steps, baby steps. First, we're gonna start it up, we're gonna rock it back and forth, make sure that the clutch engages and disengages appropriately. We've already, we already know that the wheels spin, so we're good there. So let's get it started.
Clutch feels good. Very rough idle. Check engine lights on. We'll figure that out. Reverse. Brakes work. Right away, backing it out into the driveway here. Parking brake definitely needs to be adjusted. So we'll do that later. Um, let's get back in it and let's give it a start. And let's maybe go up and down the driveway a little bit. Let's see. Just a little note, when you actually had to start this, you actually put it into the start position, like three or four two, seconds and hold three, it. Very uncomfortable four. and weird. So we actually re rewired the whole thing to make it work. Again, it's idling really rough. So maybe we will hook up the uh, Maybe we will hook up input to this thing and just see what the codes are. Reset them. Right. Adaptation. We got to figure that one out. What I found out later was actually okay. that the uh, that, that code 33 the is actually a Venus code. So the Venus needed to be retimed. Those reluctor wheels on the input camshafts needed to be retimed. And the Venus needed to be retimed completely. So we did a lot of work there. Um, and uh, that's coming up in the episode later. So you can skip right to it if you'd like. Okay, engine code has not come back. Let's roll. Ooh. Okay, brakes work pretty good. Still one error only. Okay. Get my seatbelt on here. The only codes I have on the dash right now are the DSC codes. I gotta figure that out for sure. Um, I can't hook up to it with OBD, so I have to figure out a different reader, perhaps. Okay. Oh, tight turns, that diff kind of squeaks the wheels a little bit, which means that the limited slip part of it is actually working. Um, so, yeah, tight turns, you gotta get, make sure that those plates are, are breaking all from each other. And that's actually a good thing when you first start this for the very first time is because when you do that, it allows oil to flow in between all those little plates and that's important. Give it a little gas. All right, till next time. So first test drive results. I have to fix the parking brake and adjust it. I got a pretty bad clunk coming from the rear end, which may or may not be the differential, but it feels like it's something else because the differential doesn't whine. And I've gotten it up to 60, 70 miles an hour, and it feels great. So I don't think that that's the problem, but I'll, get to, I'll, I'll investigate it. Third is the DSC module, code 58, which I think to be some sort of secondary purge pump or something. Um, and I don't think it's related to the coating at all. I think it actually is, has something to do that was issued before. Um, everything else about the engine, about, um, about the way that the car feels is just really, really good. Um, so yeah, a couple things I gotta adjust and fix and then we'll go for another test drive. Okay, so now we're doing backlash measurements just to make sure that a clunk isn't a result of a, a really high backlash. And technically the specs on this is anywhere between two and six thousandths of backlash. So if I were to just move the, this, you got, I don't know, about five, four and a half, four and a half thousandths of an inch. So 45, 10 thousandths of an inch of backlash. So it's really tight. I don't think that that's a problem at all. So I think that the differential is actually good. Um, there's a little bit of play in the output shafts, but that's just the splines into the, into the differential. So I don't think that the diff is the cause of the clunk.
Okay, go ahead. So that's right. What you're seeing Again. here is actually the rear subframe bushings are so worn out that um, Do it like every, they like all four seconds. need to be replaced completely. There's a huge clunk every time you start and stop. When you have an automatic transmission, you don't really notice it as much, but a manual transmission, when you engage the gear, uh, it is much, much more noticeable. So every time you start and stop, and it's just incredible. So it, they need to be changed, and we went to poly on these. So yeah, we've got these PSB bushings that we bought. Uh, they were eBay. They were about 250 bucks for the set, and we uh, we ended up renting a tool um, to remove those bit, those bushings. So much easier to remove with this tool. You don't even need to have the subframe um, dropped. You just drop it just a tiny bit by removing the shocks, um, and uh, and you just got to move the exhaust hanger out of the way. But the new bearings just uh, bushings rather push right on in. It feel it felt great. We had to get the aluminum sleeve in there with a dry because uh, that was a really tight fit but for the most part the whole installation uh, took a few hours wasn't really that bad and it corrected our problem of the clunking keep in mind that when you are jacking that car up like this on the lift though you're jacking it up on the springs and you really need to make sure that you hold that front end of the car so it doesn't teeter tower forward on you but this was a relatively simple installation pretty general uh, straightforward and it really made a huge difference Take a look at the dreaded P0021 code or 11 code. Basically that the M62TU cam time phasing is out so the Vanos doesn't work. It defaults to a crankshaft position sensor in order to, to keep the engine in time and make sure that it's firing correctly and not ruining the engine. What we're gonna do is we're going to evaluate that code, take a look and see what's going on, what's happening with the engine, and let's see how to fix it without removing every single piece of the engine. Okay, so we have an M62TU B46. This is the E53X5 from uh, a, uh, the Alpina-inspired uh, 4.6 IS M62 engine. And we uh, removed most of the stuff that we need to so far. Um, and what we really need to get is these bits inside of here. I want to try doing this without removing everything, like the upper timing case covers, because the only code that we have here is the P0021, which is saying that the inlet phasing on this bank, one side of the M62 is out by 20 degrees. It's negative 20 degrees. So what we need to do is reset the Venos, clock it back, and then make sure that everything is also in time. So we're gonna do both anyway, just to make sure that the entire engine is good. In order to do that, we first need to make sure that the engine is at top dead center. And to do that, you take a look at the crankshaft all the way down there. You turn this until the lines mark, the marks line up. I'll show you that. And then we can insert the uh, German Auto Solutions pin into the flywheel underneath the car, where we can take that pin, put it into the flywheel and make sure that that does not move. Then we can start taking apart the valve covers and seeing what those cams look like. All right, just to clarify, it's actually the OT mark, um, which is that guy, not the other marks. That mark needs to be aligned with that mark that you see right there. I'll annotate in the video. And that actually is what needs to be aligned. So I got to bring that OT mark a little bit more counterclockwise to align with that. This, you can see the hole and you can see the pin. Bam. Now that we've got top dead center, let's take apart these valve covers, which would be relatively easy. All the bolts that you see there on the valve covers are the only ones that are required to remove the valve cover, and that'll expose just about everything we need. Regardless of this fitting in here like a glove right now as is, I'm not really that um, that excited about it because I still need to lock both of those cams, and I need to retard this Vanos 20 degrees, and then I can place this exactly where it needs to be. The Venos on the intake cams needs to be retarded, okay? Before you, that's, that's how you're gonna get this full full time. And then, and then you can line up these, these reluctor rings appropriately. All right, so I got the exhaust cams uh, locked in place. No problem there, that's the easy stuff. And as I, Look at this one, which is not the problem. I can take the drill bit and stick it in, and it's actually going in the hole there. Wanna see a little bit there? It goes right in. This was not the problem side. The problem side is this one. Well, that's where the code was coming from. And I haven't moved this cam at all, but if I were to put this in, you'd see it is off. It is, let me zoom in a little bit. It is not going in. 
And that, I think, is the main or major problem that we're dealing with here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to loosen these up. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to start loosening some of this stuff up and we're gonna get these intake cams locked down. We'll unscrew the um, reluctor ring reverse thread. This is a 24 millimeter here on both sides. And we will reset these, both of the reluctor rings as everything is completely in time with the Vanos. Okay, so that's reverse thread. Just enough. Yep, just like that. And you should, you should be able to spin it by hand. So now you can take this and you can rotate it, right? Um, which it's just a compression fitting. So, you know, when you, when you take this off, oh, I don't know, can I even take this off? Oh no, I don't think I can. Yeah, I it's can't. gonna stop itself. Oh, so I have to take, we have to take these off if we wanna truly, truly do this. Oh my gosh, what a bummer. Let's see, hold on, hold on. Yeah, you think just you sneak in there. Maybe. It's very close. I don't know. I'm not. Place your bets now. Uh, so maybe I can sh should I get a magnet? Oh, dang it. Yeah. Isn't that coming off? Nope. All right. It ran aground. What a design flaw. You know, you could do this without having to remove these covers, but now we have to remove the covers. All right. Whatever. So we started off with this side and we did take this uh, upper timing case cover off. We really just wanted the peace of mind of knowing that the Venos itself was retarded. Um, so use this tool here to get into those holes. Actually, let me just take this out. I clean this, I clean the threads on this, on this bolt and I, uh, and inside the hole as well. And I applied Loctite. Now I know that that thing is never going to come loose. It was really torqued on there, but I really don't want it to come loose ever again. So, or ever. <laughs> so this guy holds on in there, and you can you can feel that. Retarded, advanced. So basically it's just counterclockwise until it stops. Nice firm, nothing crazy. And now you have the peace of mind of knowing that that was actually uh, fully... Uh, uh, set in place and we can start reassembling everything and then we can start doing our reluctor wheels All right, so now we're torquing these down. This is torqued to 81 foot-pounds. Uh, it's a reverse torque. So Dan's gonna start uh, You know snugging it up uh, We've got the chain tensioned with the German Auto Solutions tensioner there and uh, Now it's just a matter of torquing these down now that we've ensured that the Venos are fully retard Takes a lot of Takes a lot of. There we go. Ah, there we go. Nice. 81 foot pounds is a lot. Everything's locked. Everything's torqued. Now we just need to reassemble. All right, so now on this side here, we're gonna be using the German Auto Solutions timing kit. And this is basically the piece that screws into the Veno solenoid. And then the bank one through four uh, set here comes, comes right off of this and it sits in there like a glove. And then you rotate just like that until it sits right inside of there. And that sets this whole reluctor wheel in relation to the Venos where it needs to be. And now all you need to do is reverse tight thread this guy on and then take everything off and reinstall So before we restart this engine, uh, this was the error that I got. And you can see right here that, that we had a negative 20 degree grade KW. That's the degrees of the fault, meaning that it's so far off that you just can't even see it. And actually in the launch, you can see that there's also a 19.96 degree in for bank one, whereas bank two is reading pretty good. Um, this was the code that came up. It was a code 21 or P0021 for the inlet camshaft of bank one. This was this confirmed what our problem was. So let's see what it looks like now. Wow. Oh. Wow, it's idling real nice. Still see it there's an engine code on. Wow, it's idling nice. What does it say? Inlet camshaft control. <laughs> okay, I'm reading it with the Actron. This is like an OBD2 scanner. A little simpler, cheaper, easier. It says there's no codes. And by golly, I got no codes. Actually, you know what? Let me just put the seatbelt on just so I can just take a picture of this without any lights at all. Ha. Ah. Look at that, huh? 
camshaft. Let's see if I can see the camshaft data. Okay, camshaft data is good. Oh, hold on. All right, see that? Camshaft data is good. So here's the kicker. Charlie's been a really good friend to me over the years. I built his E24 LT1, and every time that he comes over, he's bringing steaks, he's making, he's literally taking over my kitchen and making me dinners, and um, at my own house, which is just like something that you don't really find in, in, in anybody, really. And he's just been such a good friend to me. So I wanted to surprise him by actually delivering this car to him, unbeknownst to him, and oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to be going live in about 10 minutes after this video is over as we are literally delivering this car to him in a surprise at his particular location in his house. But it's also, you know, just a really rewarding experience uh, from beginning to end on the work that was put into this and also giving my customer slash friend, my friend, um, you know, the dedication uh, that he deserves when it comes to doing a build like this and doing doing this level of work and, and just being an honest, good guy, you know? And uh, I think that those types of people nowadays are really, really hard to find. And I'm really glad that I, um, I know him and, um, and can call him my friend. So um, hope you enjoy the live video that comes up in about uh, five minutes and, um, that's all I got, guys. So uh, my name is Frank from Garageaholic. Share, like, and uh, if you want to see more of this, let me know. Thanks, guys. Take it easy. Later.